Pro Chancellor, we now come to the conferment of an honorary degree of the University of Greenwich, and I call upon Chris Philpott to present to you Alison Hadley, OBE. Pro Chancellor, Alison Hadley has played a leading role in one of the most significant social policy achievements of our time, that of more than halving the teenage pregnancy rate in England. Teenage pregnancy matters because it is a key indicator of social and economic hardship. Although some young parents manage very well, teenage mothers are more likely to suffer postnatal depression and poor mental health less likely to finish their education and find well-paid employment, and as a result, are more likely to live in poverty. Their children, too, are more likely to experience inequalities in health, education, and future economic well-being. In the 1990s, the UK had the highest rates of teenage pregnancy in Europe. The new Labour government's Social Exclusion Unit set out a 10-year teenage pregnancy strategy in 1999, which Alison was recruited to implement. She worked in the government's teenage pregnancy unit for the next 12 years and could take credit for leading what The Guardian called the success story of our time, the reduction of the under 18 conception rate by 60%. Key to this success was Alison's strong commitment to give young people control over their reproductive health and life choices. In 2010, Alice was made an OBE in recognition of her service to public health and an honorary fellow of the Faculty of Sexual Health and Reproductive Health in the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. Alison left school unsure of her career. However, she always had an interest in health and felt at ease in hospitals when accompanying her father, who was a doctor. After undertaking a six-month trial as an auxiliary nurse, she knew that nursing was for her and went on to train as a state registered nurse at Middlesex Hospital, achieving the gold medal award when she qualified in 1977. Alison loved nursing, but was always troubled by endemic poor communication with parents. At the time, this was underpinned by a strict hierarchy with aloof consultants barely talking to their patients. Trusted, friendly, patient-centered advice was in short supply. And even before the consumer health movement, Alison was ahead of her time writing books and pamphlets for patients and not about them. In 1978, Alison left nursing and moved into public health. It was as a health visitor in Brent that Alison had her first significant engagement with teenage mothers who had accidentally got pregnant, were isolated and lacked family planning information. In 1983, she joined Brooke, the UK's largest sexual health charity for young people as a family planning nurse and stayed for 17 years, rising to become press officer and then national policy manager. Alison's role was one of advocacy to encourage government to take responsibility for a proper strategy to address teenage pregnancy and sexual health. The 1997 Labour government took up the challenge and their strategy involved all departments connecting to all aspects of young people's lives. In 2000, Alison took on the government's teenage pregnancy unit and says, this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to channel my years of advocacy into delivering England's first ever comprehensive and evidence-based strategy. Alison moved from public advocacy to making things happen from the inside as a civil servant and demonstrated formidable leadership and the ability to bring people together, including politicians, health commissioners, nurses and teachers, to build the necessary partnerships. With her nursing background, she also recognised the huge contribution nurses could make to the strategy and commissioned the RCN to develop the first sexual health distance learning course. It was at this time that Alison worked with Professor David Evans at the University of Greenwich, who wrote the highly regarded sexual health skills course, which has now been studied by over 3,000 nurses and allied health professionals. Alison's influence did not stop when she left the government unit in 2012. On the contrary, she found new platforms to amplify the learning. She established the Teenage Pregnancy Knowledge Exchange at the University of Bedfordshire to be the national source of expertise and advice on all aspects of teenage pregnancy and to ensure that progress continued and lessons were not lost. Through the exchange, Alison carries out consultancy, training and research 
continuously growing the evidence base for action and passing this on to students, practitioners and policy makers. One coup for the exchange was when the World Health Organization supported Alison to share the lessons of the teenage pregnancy strategy with other countries. This has taken her to Thailand, Mexico, Argentina and Bogota. Alison is a tireless advocate for and advisor to sexual health organizations, including the all-party parliamentary group on sexual and reproductive health. She continues to be in a unique position of having a foot inside government, working two days a week as Public Health England's teenage pregnancy advisor, as well as running the independent exchange to help influence future policy. Alison also teaches, addresses conferences, and gives expert advice on TV and radio. Alison pays tribute to how her career has been inspired by the work of reproductive rights pioneers such as Dillis Cosley, who, during the more hostile environment of the 1950s and 60s, were great campaigners for reforming abortion law to stop the shocking toll on women's lives from illegal abortion, giving unmarried women, including teenagers, access to contraception, and in 1974 making contraception free on the NHS. Her latest book, Teenage Pregnancy and Young Parenthood, Effective Policy and Practice, co-authored with the WHO, is a core text on several Greenwich courses. From a time when the fear of talking about pregnancy was greater than the fear of pregnancy itself, Alison has been instrumental in transforming care such as teenagers receive friendly, non-judgmental and confidential advice from receptionist to doctor. For Alison, preventing teenage pregnancy and providing support to young parents is about reducing inequality. Alison acknowledges there is still much to do to ensure all young people are equipped with the knowledge and the confidence to make informed choices without stigma or judgment. The university is recognizing Alison Hadley with this award today for the outstanding impact of her work in public health. And now, Pro Chancellor, I have the honor and privilege of presenting to you Alison Hadley, OBE, for conferment of the degree Honorary Doctor of the University, Honoris Causa. Pro-Chancellor, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and distinguished guests, thank you so very much. I feel really honoured. I didn't know <clears throat> quite what I was going to feel here, but it's quite emotional. So I feel very honoured to receive this award from Greenwich University, which is held in such high esteem for health and allied health professionals, nurses, and particularly in the area of sexual health. And a special thank you to Professor David Evans, who has been a wonderful colleague over the last 20 years, and he's done so much to extend the role of nurses in sexual health care. And those of you who have been taught with, by David here today, I'm sure will remember him forever. And of course, huge congratulations to all of you who are graduating today. It's an amazing achievement. When I sat in my qualification ceremony 40 years ago, it was not a graduate profession then, and the hall had none of the grandeur here today, I tell you. I had no career plan, really, and I would never have imagined the things that I have done or ever thought I would be here with you today. You never know where nursing will take you. I loved hospital nursing, the close contact with patients. It's such a real privilege to have that relationship with patients, and I still vividly remember some of them, even after all these years. And the way that nursing with compassion and kindness and good communication can make a real difference to patients' recovery. But it was really my curiosity about the wider determinants of health that led me into the community and into health visiting. And again, I remember many of the families I visited as a health visitor, the inside of their homes, their children. But it was the teenage parents who affected me the most. The vast majority hadn't planned their pregnancy. Their choice had been denied by no sex education, 
no discussion at home with parents or carers, and a big fear about asking for contraception lest it wasn't confidential or that someone would tell them off. The minority who had chosen pregnancy were often entering parenthood with a heavy burden of disadvantage, wanting to do things differently from their own experience, but with little help, many were struggling to cope. And it was really watching the fragility of their lives that crystallized for me how fundamentally important sex education and reproductive rights were and are to young people to give them control over their life choices. And that set me on a journey, a career journey over the next 35 years. It was at Brooke, really, that I found my, um, my passion. For those who don't know, Brooke was opened in 1964 by Helen Brooke as the first service that would offer contraception to unmarried girls and boys. So at the time that the Beatles released their first record in 1962, you could not get contraception unless you were married or had proof that you were going to be married. So for those of you on the left-hand side of the hall, that seems like ancient history, but it isn't that long ago that it was a real struggle to get contraception. So Brooke provided a safe, confidential space for young people to come and talk to friendly doctors and nurses, ask any questions they had, discuss any concerns, and get the contraception and sexual health advice they needed. Sadly, some young people found Brooke's doors too late like the 15-year-old girl whose mother had taken her to her GP because she had missed two periods. But she denied the possibility that she could be pregnant because her mother was in the room and she hadn't yet told her that she started to have sex. So the last of periods was put down to exam stress and the pregnancy continued until I eventually saw her at Brooke when she was 25 weeks pregnant. She was too late for an abortion and her life had been fundamentally changed by the doctor's failure to give her just a moment of confidentiality. Many other young people lived in places where there was no brook or young people-friendly services, and they were very wary of going to family planning clinics or a GP where they might meet a family friend. So all this, of course, during the 1980s and 1990s was fueling England's high teenage pregnancy rate. So much of the time at Brook was calling on government to take responsibility to give young people the knowledge and the skills they needed to prevent unplanned pregnancy and look after their sexual health. So when the Labour government did respond to that widespread call for action and publish the strategy, I knew it was a chance not to be missed. And it was a chance for me to put all that advocacy that we'd been working on for years and be part of the journey of change of the strategy. And I feel very lucky to have been there at the right moment. The 12 years in government um, implementing the strategy was hugely busy, it was all-consuming, but it was a wonderful experience, working with fantastic colleagues in health, in education, in social care, who were all determined to make it a success. But it wasn't without its challenges. Early progress in reducing the rates was pretty slow, which prompted lots of critical media headlines from newspapers saying it was a disaster, it was a failure. And some aspects of the strategy, like providing contraception in school and college-based clinics, were attacked by a small but very vocal minority. But when I was called to defend the strategy or to reassure the ministers that they were doing the right thing, it was remembering the individual young people I had seen at Brook and knowing the difference that the strategy would make to their lives that helped me make the case. I never forgot their faces and their stories. So over the last 18 years, the number of young people becoming pregnant every year in England has dropped from 46,000 to 18,000. And the number of teenage mothers who've returned and continued in education has more than doubled. There is still much more to do to make sure that the next generation of young people get the knowledge and skills they need to look after themselves. But it is evidence that high teenage pregnancy rates are not inevitable if we give young people choices. It's evidence, too, that the policies governments choose really do matter. Some policies do good things, others less so. As well as making a big difference to young people's lives here in England, um, the, the strategy has been recognised by the World Health Organisation as a model of how other countries can reduce their high teenage pregnancy rate, which robs so many adolescents of their education, 
and future well-being. And it's been an amazing pleasure and privilege to share the lessons with other countries. Some have much bigger challenges than we ever faced. Child marriage, no legal abortion, very limited education, particularly for girls. But what I've been struck by is how young people in these other countries want exactly the same as young people here. When I was in Bogota recently, I visited a, one of the largest high schools in the city and met the students there. And they told me that getting pregnant in their teens was the biggest barrier to them fulfilling their ambitions. They really didn't want to become young parents. All they wanted was good sex education, contraception, and friendly staff to help them, just as the same as teenagers here. The World Health Organization has a big goal by 2030 that all adolescents will be able to fulfill their ambitions, have education, and have good health. And reducing teenage pregnancy in those countries is one of the strategies the WHO is taking forward. So looking back 40 years of a career, I feel really, really lucky to have had a career where I could make a bit of a difference, where I worked with inspirational and committed colleagues, and which I enjoyed so much that it never felt like work. And that is a real bit of luck. My passion was young people's sexual and reproductive rights and choices. You will all find your own passion. But remember, whatever path you choose, you will see and learn things that can influence policy and practice, and that you will all be important people who can change things for the better. So thank you again for this huge honor. I'm only sorry that my husband and our two children, George and Norna, who are the most important people in my life, are not able to be here today. And they have supported me all through this journey, including my children putting up with me, putting condom packets in their bags as they went off to different places. So thank you for that. And of course, many congratulations to you all. I wish you the very best for your adventures ahead. Thank you.